Okay, well, hi everyone. Welcome to my presentation. My name is Lena. It's nice to see all of you guys here. A little bit about me. I go by the name Inverse Cos online. I am an avid TikToker. I love to vlog and film ARM64 reverse engineering and exploitation type videos. I currently do incident response at SecureWorks, and prior to that, I was the incident response lead at Accenture Security. I also do a lot of blogging. So I like to do research mainly around APT level techniques and how to detect them. And I'm actually releasing an entire incident response bootcamp course, which I'm set to release end of this year, early next year. So yeah, watch this face. Today we're gonna cover a few things, but mainly I'm gonna go over four cases that I worked over the last two years, and I'm gonna use that as kind of the backbone for this presentation. What I wanna do is show you how the political relationship between China and Australia directly impacts the type of attacks that they escalate towards you know, organizations within our region. I'm gonna run through four of these attacks that I worked, and then I'm gonna round off everything with a bit of a you know, background on China's recruitment policies. What I mean by that is recruitment policies into APT groups and the thought curriculums that kind of underpin what goes on in China. Disclaimer, this presentation does not represent my personal political views. Now I know what you're thinking. You're probably wondering if I'm a Chinese spy. I am not. <laughs> I can't prove that to you, so I'll let you guys make up your, your own uh, opinion about that at the end. I'm also gonna be saying allegedly a lot because with threat intel, I'm sure most of you know, you can rarely ever 100% attribute something to a threat actor. But I might slip up, but just mentally insert that. It's hard to talk about China without talking about the Chinese dream. Now this is a kind of the ideology that underpins every single generation or every single communist party leader that comes on. Mao Zedong had it, Deng Xiaoping had it, and now Xi Jinping has his own. For him, it's Zhonghua Minzhu de Wei Da Fuxing, which is the great revival, rejuvenation of China. Now, it's underpinned by two main goals. The first one is for China to become a well-off society by 2021. The second is for China to become a developed nation by 2049. Now, all goals dwindle without some kind of metric for success. And in this instance, China wants to become a world-leading economy, the world-leading economy, which I don't think, you know, is like a big surprise to everyone. And one of these initiatives for China to achieve this goal is something called One Belt, One Road. This whole thing is about setting up a series of ports and hubs along Central Asia and Europe with the goals of facilitating maritime access, financial cooperation with all of these countries, and to make renminbi, which is the Chinese currency, the main currency. Now, it's not as simple as financing a set of ports and hubs in these countries or you know, borrowing money to build them or you know, lending ports and hubs. China also has made a series of interesting acquisitions. Now, I've obviously cherry-picked one that I personally found interesting, and this one is the acquisition of Lynx Telecommunications by Citic Telecom. Why does this fascinate you, Lena? Great question, guys. So this is really interesting because this basically gave China access to the telecommunications network of 130 countries that sit right within the Belt and Road region. 130 countries. Now, I don't know if all of you guys were here. Well, I'm sure all of you were alive for this. It wasn't that long ago. But the big kerfuffle around 5G and Huawei and Australia and thoughts of corporate espionage, you can see why I slid this into the slides. In China, there's actually something called the National Intelligence Law. This law underpins and decrees that every single citizen business, business subsidiary, must conform to this intelligence law. You must abide and facilitate any kind of goal that the Chinese Communist Party or government puts onto you, even if you are a working Chinese citizen in another country for another organization. Do you guys remember the big Log4j blow up that happened last year? 
Well, when Alibaba came forward with this vulnerability, they did not disclose this first to the Chinese government, and that has resulted in a series of extremely punishing repercussions, such as Chinese regulators completely severing you know, contracts and not wanting to work with Alibaba. I will note, it's very interesting that they did not disclose this to the regulators with their own knowledge of you know, how business conduct is made in China. Before we kind of jump into the incident response cases and everything, I want to give you like a smash bang TLDR of like the shit, the fucking crackdown of Australia and China's big relationship. You guys would have seen all over Daily Telegraph, Sky News, and like all over YouTube, like videos of all this crap. Well, okay, this is just a quick mind dump. In 2010, we were setting up the National Broadband Network. And in 2012, we, we kind of, it wasn't, it wasn't like an official thing, but we didn't really want Huawei to put forward bids for it. In 2018, Australia actually banned Huawei from constructing our 5G network. We did not just stop there. We actually went over to the UK government and asked them also not to use Huawei. Why? Because there were fears of corporate espionage, so much so that in the same year we passed a foreign interference law that made any kind of espionage illegal. It did not say espionage from China. Luckily, we have more tact than that, but you can understand the subtleties of what drove that uh, policy. In 2020, China comes out with 14 grievances. Now, this, this is like a list of, it's like a breakup letter, kind of, like 14 things that China had an issue with Australia about. You know, things like, oh, you're stopping, you know, our citizens, our, our students coming into Australia to study, you know, what's going on with Huawei and Australia, you know, interfering with UK, just like a list of things they were upset about. This is a recurring theme, and I'm gonna show you why this is a recurring theme later. All right. Quick rundown, 2020, 2021. You guys were here, you were alive last year and the year before, hopefully. Uh, you would have seen this deteriorating relationship. In 2020, you know, COVID pandemic, etc. Australia joined the push and the inquisition into WTF was going on with the COVID, you know, what was happening. In 2021, a whole bunch of interesting things happened, which kind of boiled the relationship into like a very bad point. In 2021, we blocked any kind of foreign investment from China, China into any of our sensitive you know, areas, such as infrastructure, critical infrastructure, you know, things that kind of underpin our economy. In 2021, we did a whole series of things, right? There was the thing going on in China, in Xinjiang, with the Weizhou, with the Uyghur Muslims, what was going on in Taiwan, what was going on in Hong Kong with the riots. We obviously, you know, were not supportive of those activities. At the end of the year, well, not really, around September, we joined something called, I don't know if this is called AUKUS or AUKUS. So we joined this, and it's basically a US-led initiative where a whole bunch of countries, Japan included, have signed on to acquire a series of nuclear submarines to counter China if, you know, push ever came to shove. Everything kind of came to a point last month. Wait, it's September now, right? Or is it August? <laughs> uh, everything kind of happened in July 2022 where Australian and Chinese ministers met for the first time since 2019. Now China came forward with a series of demands, okay? Uh, these are things like you have to treat China as a partner, you must not adhere to what other countries are saying, you cannot, cannot target China under the influence of third parties, wink US, you must build a positive relationship, you know, just a series of demands. And Australia's response to that was pretty, uh, you know, it was pretty straightforward, don't obstruct trade, you know, if we agree to this, China must remove sanctions on anything happening relating to Australian exports. Interesting. Why is this? Well, China and Australia have a very interesting relationship. And I, I'm, I'm holding on to you guys, but I'm, I will jump into a case really quickly. So I'm not just going to talk about politics this whole talk. So Australia exports iron ore, gas, oil, and coal to China, to the point where China actually makes up 36.5% of our total exports. It is the biggest country we export to. It, the, the, the dent that China could put on our economy if it impacts our major businesses is massive. China knows that. 
So right in 2021, when all this crap was happening, China decided to end their dependency on Australia for iron ore. They set this forward with two plans. The first one was they actually purchased a mine in the West African mountain re region, spanning 110 Ks. The second was they wanted to export, import iron ore from Brazil. But, you know, Brazil had a series of shutdowns because of COVID-related illnesses, etc. This is massive. And so now I'm going to introduce you to a threat group. This group, I work at SecureWorks, so we refer to this uh, APT group as Bronze Mohawk. You may have heard this from other vendors. Most, I think the most common one that's probably used in write-ups is APT40. So this is the threat group we're going to talk about today. They are pernicious and extremely frustrating to work on. So in 2020, the ACSC released a very interesting report. Now this was a long AF report, okay? It covered so many TTPs that were very interesting. What I found interesting and tactful was they did not say what country this report was about. They just said a nation state. But, you know, it's in my presentation, you do the math. So it had a lot of really interesting uh, TTPs they referenced. For example, this nation state group would abuse Telerik, would abuse Manage Engine, would abuse Jira, would abuse SharePoint. They would then download the LDIF DE tool. They would, in, they would install Cobalt Strike through DLL injection. Now, what is so interesting about this? Oh, the fact that we worked cases that covered every single one of these instances from 2020 through to 2022. Coincidence? Not sure. So when China announced their plan to stop taking iron ore from Australia, one of our clients in the mining sector got hit. Got hit, okay, I'm never gonna say that again. I don't like how that sounds. But basically this started with a series of web scanning. Now this web scanning happened like months, like four, five to six months, prior to intrusion actually occurring. They were using something called Nuclei, which is an open source, like a scanning tool. And this tool is like, it's, it's awesome. You know, pen testers use it. It's just, you know, they weren't just using this. I will note they were using a series of other things as well, but this was the main thing that they were kind of focusing on. Just move my mic a bit. So, what happened was they started enumerating all the egress points. They then decided to focus solely on the contractor portals. This is going to be a recurring theme. Organizations in utilities, in infrastructure, in manufacturing, they all have contractor portals most of the time. And this is the sole focus that this threat group seems to focus their attention on. So they found one of these, you know, third, third party contractor portals. They then decided to actively exploit it using SQL injection. These, these attempts were successful. They then proceeded to use SQL injection to download the security EVTX file, which is the security event logs on an operating system. Why on earth are they downloading security event logs? You know, there's a plethora of information that you can glean from those logs, such as user login activity, baselines for normal user activity, what's going on, who's logging in, what systems interact with this host. They started pulling that data. They then proceeded to install a JSP web shell. This is, this is okay, this is a thing. China loves Java, I should get that on a t-shirt. They love Java. If you think about Telerik and you think about Manage Engine, you think about SharePoint, the vulnerability that underpins those exploits all focus on Java deserialization. They are obsessed with Java. They use Java web shells, they love Java. So they installed the Java web shell. This is the actual web shell that they used. And then through the web shell, it facilitated remote code execution. So then they, they then installed LDIF DE. Now LDIF DE is a Microsoft owned tool that's used by sysadmins primarily to enumerate forest, domain, you know, like query domain related things. They started to do this and enumerate what was going on on the host. They then proceeded to issue a series of, you know, uh, rec recon type commands, preceded by dumping out credentials, uh, dumping out LSAS directly. Now, this is a technique that uh, we, we kind of saw skyrocketing around 2018 onwards. Uh, we really saw China moving away from focusing on using Mimikatz, et cetera, to using other methods of performing credential dumping. The end result and the ultimate goal for this threat actor on this specific client was information access. They started to view files relating to mining pricing, iron pricing, mining documents. Hundreds and hundreds of files were enumerated. 
Outside of that, they also had a heavy focus on abusing legacy authentication into Microsoft 365. Things like EWS was a primary focus that they were using. They were using that to glean information off mailboxes and access data pertaining to the organization. They also had awareness of several employees within the organization, usernames, and the, the, you know, everything was kind of seemed premeditated. It wasn't like they performed recon when they were in the host and then proceeded to use those usernames. They knew those usernames when they were in. At the very end, we had taken around 30 plus IPs that were being abused by this threat actor. Now, I say 30 or so because I'm sure there were more, but it's difficult to kind of tie an IP into as an actual IOC unless you can link it to some kind of contextual threat activity, you know, prior or post. Right after that, one of our clients of the energy sector then gets hit. You know, I talked about iron, I talked about energy. Very funny. So this client got an alert from a trusted third party. These alerts typically go like this. You get an email, and the email says, we have observed host one and two interacting, or sorry, we have observed IP one and IP two interacting with your system on dates X and Y. Sound familiar? So this client received this alert. I want to add a caveat here. In almost every single incident case that we have worked where a client has received an alert from this trusted third party, we have found more IPs than what was listed and an earlier intrusion date. I say this because I think it's important that if you're an analyst or you're performing uh, you know, IR on a, on, you know, a client or yourself, you don't solely take that as the truth and you look prior because you will miss a lot of evidence. So one of the IPs that we found, we had actually linked back to a microtech router that belonged to a home network. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because this particular threat group likes to proxy their attacks and I'll explain how they do that. So similar TTPs uh, started to emerge. They started to enumerate all the egress points looking for contractor portals and voila, they use Nuclei again. They got into the contractor portal through a vulnerability and then they started to use, they, they thought this third party credential was decommissioned. They used this decommissioned credential to log in. They proceeded to create malicious user accounts. And the end result was file access and enumeration within the portal. So viewing files and documents. They tried to make RPC requests to SharePoint as well to enumerate documents. And at the very end, one of the IPs that we pulled actually belonged to another case that I had worked a little earlier. So that was interesting. They were reusing IPs within this like, time frame that they were performing their attacks. On top of this, another thing that I noted was they almost seemed like they had a playbook. So prior to actually getting into this organization, they started to almost like a playbook, like tick off, OK, are they vulnerable to Telerik? Are they vulnerable to Mobile Iron? And they were issuing requests and commands to see if this company was vulnerable to them. And th this was like almost down to a T in the copy face report, the types of you know, exploitation methods that they would abuse. The end of these two incidents, it was really interesting. The first thing I wanted to point out was it was very clear there was a varying level of sophistication on the hands-on keyboard activity. What I mean by that is when you're working an APT case, a lot of the times when you look at the incident timeline, it's simultaneous activities happening at once. There was variation in the sophistication levels. At the very beginning, mistakes were being made, typos were being made. It almost seemed like kind of confused. And then in the middle, when, with the actual file enumeration, you know, things going on, that was a little bit sophisticated. Now, this has been an hypothesis that's been made by, you know, white hat vendors and also, you know, people like people or anonymous groups like Intrusion Truth that perhaps the structure of a Chinese APT group is similar to a SOC structure where they have an L1, L2 and L3. Military. Now, China is heavily invested in their military policies. They are the second largest spender in military, right after the US. They have the largest naval base in the world. They have 290 nuclear powerheads. They have hypersonic missiles. It is a massive area that China invests in because they have the goal of being able to deter US if conflict ever arose. And so I think what was happening with Ukraine and Russia was extremely interesting for China to watch. Back in 2017, I wanted to highlight this case because I wanted to talk a little bit about China Chopper, was this aerospace defense firm in Australia was compromised. They did not say, I will say they did not say China did it, but you know, 
allegedly China. So they got compromised, and this resulted in 30 gigs of data being extracted from the organization. And this was done through a web shell called China Chopper. China Chopper is notorious. It ha it's been around for so many years. Now, I say this because this web shell is still being used. Do you guys remember the big like Microsoft Exchange vulnerability that was here last year? Yeah, I'm seeing some nods. So we had cases come in revolving that where the exchange hosts were popped, resulting in China Chopper getting deployed. China Chopper is interesting because it is very simple to detect, but I, with that, the point I'm trying to make is I don't think they are trying to hide from being detected. What works, works, and they're still using the same effing web shell. So this is a screenshot of the Chinese. OK, I don't know what these vehicles are called. Are they flying vehicles? I actually don't know the name for this thing in the sky. <laughs> uh, this, this is the flying vehicle from China and the F-35 one version of whatever this, this, this plane is called. And I know that's not the right word, but English is my second language, so just be nice to me. So at the start of this year, you know, there were speculations that China had potentially copied a US Black Hawk design. And actually last week, uh, China, this new flying vehicle was seen in China, in Beijing, that resembled it. So interesting. In 2021, so this is last year, there was a Chinese businessman called Qing Shuren, and he admitted to and was found guilty of smuggling up to 100K thousand, 100K? Just $100,000 worth of hydrophones to Chinese companies from the US. Hydrophones are underwater sound monitoring devices that are extremely useful in the military context. He was actually suspe suspected of around $8 million worth, but was only found guilty of 100K. And it was suspected that he was tasked by the Polytechnical University. Universities play a critical role in China, and I'll touch on that towards the end of the presentation. So that brings me to the third initiative, Made in China 2025. This is the third initiative that Xi Jinping has put forward. This initiative has the goal of making China be to become some kind of technological powerhouse. For China, technological leadership is about innovation, it's about creation, and it's about dominating areas like AI, biotechnology, quantum computing, you know, advanced robotics, cybersecurity. This is a massive area of investment. If you think about the applications of AI and you think about like daily life in China where they, they use Weibo, they use WeChat, they use QQ, that the amount of facial recognition technology and the amount of data that they have to crunch, you can understand how it's pivotal to the growth of the country. So, Made in China 2025. For China, the ultimate goal is something called self-sufficiency. It's absolute control of the supply chain from start to finish. And this is not a new concept, right? If you look at what Jeff Bezos is doing and what Elon Musk are doing, they basically want to bake absolute control of the supply chain from start to finish. It gives you complete control. And for China, that is what they want to do. It's gotten to the point where they have pushed you know, billions of dollars into R&D, reduce tax rates on any tech companies, approve mergers and acquisitions for any Chinese company that wants to merge with a foreign tech company. That brings me to the next point. There is an arms race to become the semiconductor uh, manufacturer lead of the world. If you think about semiconductors, they are a core enabler of new tech, like quantum computing, AI, military-grade tech, surveillance. They, China wants to win this because in order for them to become a technological powerhouse, they want control of the supply chain, and the core tech that they need are semiconductors. And right now, semiconductor industry is controlled or primarily produced in China's two favorite countries, the US and Taiwan. So you can see why this is very interesting for China. They've made a massive fund to fund local semiconductor manufacturing. They pour billions of dollars into it. And as a part of their five-year plan, they want a 70% import substitution. And what that means is if you're a local company in China, they expect you to only purchase from Chinese companies unless it doesn't, it's not created in China. Then they'll reach outwards. I also worked a very interesting case. Now, this client was a very 
I thought this client, I'm talking, I don't think this is a microphone. Uh, th this client was awesome. They are one of the world leading manufacturers, creators of this technology. In fact, I'm sure what they've created is in this room right now. They are a global pioneer of this tech and it's only them. They basically, you know, what happened was the dwell time was roughly four plus months. We were never able to isolate the initial intrusion because the client did not have a seam and the client started to destroy, law, uh, you know, like shut down systems and rebuild them prior to taking a disk image for us to analyze. Now, what we found was they started to perform DLL search order hijacking in order to install Cobalt Strike, which is what was listed in the copy paste report. They were also doing a, you know, manual dumping of LSAS for credential theft, where this is where they just dump out the LSAS process and offline crack it with Mimikatz or whatever tool they're using to extract corporate credentials. They then, the end goal for them was data, specifically research data. In fact, they did this manually. And by manually, I, there was no bat script, they were manually doing it. They started to pivot into hosts in Poland, Switzerland, uh, hosts in Australia, US and UK, manually looking for documents with the words innovation, patent, uh, you know, R&D, research, like, you, you know, the kind of documents that are basically the crux of what this company is. And then what happened was the next month, China made a company. Jokes, they didn't do that, <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, but what ended up happening was when the client kind of found out that this was occurring, uh, and before they engaged us, they started to do a series of mitigating steps, like they started to shut off systems, block IPs, and of course, what does that do? It alerts the threat actors. And so a series of punishing retaliation attempts were made by China where they proceeded to change, they changed a whole bunch of usernames and passwords relating to domain admin. So they locked people out of their accounts and they also enabled 300 user accounts, disabled accounts that they then started to use. It became like mayhem. This is a screenshot of the timeline where they started to do DLL search order hijacking. Okay, this case was really fun. This was one of our nursing home clients. And if you're like, why do they target a nursing home? Great question, we'll go into it. So this, this client was a nursing home. And basically this client also had received from this trusted third party an alert that, you know, three alleged bronze mohawk, mo, bronze mohawk IPs were interacting with their environment. We ended up finding an earlier intrusion date and found more IPs than what was listed. Now, how they got in, they exploited mobile iron, which is a, you know, a vulnerability in mobile iron, and they then proceeded to use that to install a JSP web shell. Once again, that's a screenshot of the JSP web shell that they had installed. They began enumerating credentials, they went through all the var log directories and cleaned out lines of the logs pertaining to the attacker IPs. They manually removed those lines within the logs that would be evidence for us, right, to detect what was happening. The end goal of the attack wasn't data access, it was the installation of Tsunami, which is a bot. They essentially turned this host into a bot. Now, if you think about what, we, what I said earlier about the energy client, where we saw microtech routers, like, you know, as those IPs, this is kind of, rem this is kind of, we, as SecureWorks believe that this is most likely what they were using as a proxy. They do proxies two ways, right? They have bots that they set up, or they have, a host with a web shell and the victim with the web shell and they pivot through Tor, use the web shell to access the next web shell. So, interesting. This is a screenshot of the initial command that they ran to install the Java-based web shell. China loves Java. And this is a screenshot also of the command that they ran to install Tsunami, which they remotely pulled from the attacker-owned uh, host. Now, Xi Jinping is not gonna live forever. Unfortunately, he's not a vampire. So he understands that in order for China, the Chinese dream to eventuate, he has to get the support of the youth. And so starting from 2021, Xi Jinping has introduced something called, you know, Xi Jinping thought. It's a thought curriculum that will follow the Chinese youth from, you know, youth onwards. And it's about teaching uh, these kids the idea of cultural responsibility, cultural pride, nationalistic views, and it's to kind of strengthen the kind of belief in what China wants to become and the goals of China. Georgetown University CSET division published an amazing report. They basically 
figured out that six of these universities are linked with six state actors that come out of China. The first one on the list, Hainan University, linked to APT40, aka Bronze Mohawk, the threat group we've been talking about today. And on top of that, you can see on the screen a photo of Zhang Tanghe, who is a assistant professor that Cyber Sleuth identified as a part of an APT group. Below him, we have a photo of Professor Gu Jian from Hainan University, who's a part of APT40, aka Bronze Mohawk. Now, this professor is very interesting. Just like in Australia, in China, they have student boards. This professor would post on student boards who can find, the, who can find a me method of bypassing X thing, you know, who, who has a new method of bypassing UAC or, you know, AMSI or whatever. Like, he'd pass, he'd, he'd post questions and he'd offer cash prizes of up to 78,000 USD. That is an, a, a mind-blowing amount of money for a university professor to be offering out. And what else this report covered were what the focuses of each university was. Every single one of these universities had a big focus on cybersecurity, but in particular, the applications of AI and machine learning to cybersecurity. Interesting. So that brings me to kind of the takeaways for my presentation. The first one that I want to leave you with is the impact of presidential terms and checks and balances. In Western politics, our prime ministers and presidents hold a term of around four years. That kind of colors the way that they, they put forward policies. They want to maximize what they can do within their term. It's not like that in China. Xi Jinping will be, the, you know, will be the chairman for the foreseeable future. That enables him to think about the plans and policies that he wants to enact 20, 30, 40 years into the future. In Western politics, we also have labor, liberal parties, Democrats, Republicans, the whole checks and balance where you, you know, the opposing party can question policies or you know, raise debate. That doesn't happen in China. The policies that are put forward are the policies that are in place. The second I want to say is this is only the beginning. China's cyber capability is elementary compared to what it will become. Even in my experience working on Chinese cases in my career, I have seen an increased levels of, level of sophistication from when I first started working in IR till now. You know, previous to this, they weren't even targeting cloud. Now they're following in Russia's footsteps where they are targeting, you know, Azure, M365 instances, leveraging service principal accounts. They are getting more sophisticated in how they perform their operations. The third is something that I hope that you can take away from this presentation. The cyber attacks that happen, especially when it comes to APT groups, are so linked to the political parties and countries where they come from. I hope you can see that of the four cases I kind of explored, that these cases are linked to what was happening in the geopolitical climate. The last point I want to make is how important it is for us in the blue team, you know, you know as white hats or if you identify as a gray hat, of how important it is that we are more proactive than we are reactive. In IR, we tend to kind of just react to situations. Same with threat intel, we kind of react to situations or we look up IPs once they've happened. But given the fact that we know China actually has a policy called the Science of Military Policy where universities are a key vessel in how China, the government, comes up with strategies, especially relating to cybersecurity. So we know the link that universities have and the research that comes out of universities are going to be used by the government. So it's only a matter of time before it makes the jump from theoretical into practice. And so listen up or read up. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening. Uh, if you want to stay in touch with me, you can always... <laughs> I'm a troll, I'm a troll. <laughs>